stockpile. 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 What is going on with our stockpile? What is the plan with the stockpile? We have a stockpile, and that's why it's called a stockpile. Doomsday preppers used to be seen as nuts, preparing for a future that would never arrive. But COVID-19 is making preppers look increasingly prescient. A lot of people buy gold and silver, but I invested heavily in toilet paper because everybody needs it. But before you rent a truck and rush out to trample some strangers at your nearest big box store, there's more to know about stockpiling. Let's start with hoarding. You know, that debilitating mental illness that affects between two and 6% of the population and is enjoyed by millions more as light entertainment. This house is absolutely a disaster. While the word hoard is now synonymous with amassing an ever-growing pile of old junk which slowly takes over your life, it was once used to describe a safely guarded supply of treasure. Keeping over 80 dead cats in your home is almost certainly a bad idea. But whether or not it's weird to keep 400 pounds of dried beans in your basement is really a question of perspective. In fact, the US government's issued guidelines for exactly how much and what they encourage individuals to hoard. So unless there's at least 14 gallons of bottled water in your apartment right now, it's time to step up your game. But when it's the government itself that's doing the hoarding, they prefer to call it something else entirely. National stockpile. National stockpile. National stockpile. So what's in the national stockpile exactly? And how did it start? Remember when a genetically engineered virus called Cobra, a lethal combination of the common cold and smallpox, swept through New York City? You don't because it never happened. But it was the plot of The Cobra Event, a novel that President Clinton read in 1998, which inspired him to hold a meeting with scientists and cabinet members to discuss the risk of bioterrorism. Roughly six months later, he signed the National Pharmaceutical Stockpile into law. Its first order of business? Preparing for Y2K. A Senate panel describes Y2K, the year 2000 computer bug, as a worldwide crisis. January 1st, 2000 came and went without an apocalyptic event. The first time the stockpile was deployed was after 9-11. Since then, the stockpile has expanded to include more than just pharmaceuticals and has been dipped into over 60 times. What's now known as the National Strategic Stockpile is kept in an undisclosed number of locations across the country, maintained by a staff of roughly 200, and in 2016 had an annual budget of $571 million. That may sound like a lot, but when you consider the US is projected to spend around $50 billion per year on the upkeep of its nuclear arsenal over the next decade, $571 million sounds more like the absolute least they can do. The COVID-19 outbreak is revealing it's not just what you put in a strategic stockpile, it's how you store it. Thousands of medical face masks stored in the stockpile were found with dry rot when they were needed most. Many of the elastic bands were so degraded that they could snap if the mask was worn. But even with proper storage, many items have a finite shelf life. Some countries are also thinking about possible catastrophes that could cause certain items to, shall we say, permanently expire. I'm talking about extinctions. Deep in an abandoned coal mine in Norway, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault is keeping a Noah's Ark of seeds in the event crops are wiped out by environmental disasters. Never mind their assumption that humans will be around to plant them. England has its own bank of frozen DNA from animal species in the event that they someday go extinct and we need to whip up a new batch in a lab. Because if Hollywood has taught us anything, it's that cloning always works out as planned with no disastrous unintended ramifications. So, stockpiling. Something countries do because there might not be enough of something one day, but also something done for the opposite reason. Sometimes we stockpile because there's too much of something. Like how the Federation of Quebec Maple Syrup Producers keeps a strategic reserve of as much as 160,000 barrels of syrup, which they use to control the price of their delicious tree blood. And many governments also subsidize farmers by buying up products when there's not enough demand. In the 1980s, while the US was in a recession, word got out that the Reagan government was hoarding 500 million pounds of excess cheese, which forced the then president to give out what came to be known as government cheese to Americans struggling financially. I'm gonna tell you something about government cheese. I said it right, government cheese. Not government, government cheese. But just because there's more than enough of a product to go around, doesn't mean it will necessarily get into the hands of those who need it most. In 2012, the government of India helped keep wheat prices high by building stockpiles. The poorly stored wheat rotted even as millions starved. 
Even now in the US, we see how stockpiling can hurt the citizens of a country during a time of abundance and excess. Panic buyers, worried about the impact of the coronavirus, are making their own mini stockpiles, which is harming another type of stockpile, the country's food banks, which are themselves being overwhelmed by people and normally rely on the same groceries that are being stripped bare to donate food to them in the first place. Hundreds of cards lining up for the Greater Pittsburgh Food Bank. Meanwhile, farmers across the country are having to literally build graves for their onions that no one is buying now that restaurants are closed and apparently Americans don't know what to do with vegetables when they're not paying someone else to cook them at a restaurant. Basically, we're learning it doesn't matter how big a stockpile is if there's problems with the supply chain required to deliver it to those in need. So, in conclusion, stockpiles for when there's not enough or too much of something. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, with potentially positive or negative side effects. What did you expect? Some kind of value judgment on whether or not hoarding is objectively good or bad that fits neatly into your worldview at the specific moment you're watching this? Well, I guess if you want a simple answer, all you really need to know is 